Welcome. I am Christina Campbell, your host for Sexual Freedom for Women, where you can learn how to lose your inhibitions, deeply connect, and finally experience the pleasure you have always desired. Today, I am interviewing dating and relationship coach Lisa Shield. I'm going to read a little bit about her, and then we'll get into this wonderful topic. So Lisa Shield, 17 years ago, when no one would admit to dating online, Lisa Shield posted her first profile. Two years and 100 first dates later, she met and married the love of her life. Her success led her to become one of the first dating and relationship coaches in the nation. Through writing, speaking, leading workshops, and one-on-one -on -one coaching, Lisa has helped thousands of singles around the world to find loving, lasting relationships. Today, we're going to talk about what uh, Lisa really talks about, which is uh, share your head before you share your bed. The art of getting emotionally naked before you get physically naked. Lisa, thank you so much for being here. Welcome. Thank you, Christina. It's what a pleasure. Oh, I'm so excited to have you <coughs> drift in um, to <laughs> and be a collaborator. So what does it mean to get emotionally naked? So getting emotionally naked means opening up and creating an emotional connection, learning for both men and women, but learning how to be vulnerable and real and really share your deepest self with somebody before you get physically naked with them. So um, when we're talking about first dates, you know, how, how does somebody get emotionally naked in a first date? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to be very clear that getting emotionally naked is not about airing all your dirty laundry. So this is not about, you know, people often think it means that they're going to just disclose everything. I'm going to tell you all my deepest, darkest secrets, and that's getting emotionally naked. That's actually not true. That's just what I call giving disclaimers, you know, talking about all the stuff that like to watch out for, right? Um, but getting emotionally naked on a first date would look more like, <clears throat> excuse me, opening up and letting the other person know how you feel about him or her, right? Like really the deepest level of intimacy. So there's five levels of intimacy and the first which I call fully clothed in true naked dating fashion is really about platitudes or cliches. Hi, how are you? Lovely weather, nice day, that kind of stuff. It's a very important connection because people can't be invisible. We want to, we want to be noticed. It's nice when somebody even just says hi to us. So that's the first level. The second level is called unbuttoning your shirt. And that's where people start. This is really where most dates go. It's really that interview stage on a date where it's all question and answer, where people get so bored and you think you're making a connection, but all you're really doing is just sharing a bunch of information. The third level would be, um, what do I call it? I'm drawing a blank, but there's, you know, the third level is um, like naked from the waist down, right? Or from the waist up. But that's like, you know, with your shirt off and you're somewhat exposed. And that's just where you're, um, that's sharing ideas and opinions. So at that level, which is the third level, that's where people start to divide a little bit. You know, I am a Republican, you're a Democrat, I believe in abortion, I, you know, I'm pro-right, pro-choice, pro-life, pro you know, so that's where things start to get a little bit separate but it's still all at the intellectual level. And then naked dating is at the last two levels. So um, when you get down to your undies, that's where <laughs> you're really, um, that's the part where you're um, sharing how, your emotions, where you really share how you feel about things. Like where you might say something like, my mother died of cancer when I was 15, and that was very rough for me. Um, you know, or you might say something like, um, you know, I went through a very rough time after my divorce. The very deepest level of intimacy, which is buck naked, is where you're really talking about not just 
feelings and emotions, but how do I feel about you? So that's the deepest, deepest level of connection. That's the, where there's the most risk. Because if I tell you I'm having an amazing time on this date, I really enjoy your company. You know, I'd love to see you again. This is so much fun. I don't know if you feel the same way about me. Or if I write to you and I, you know, we're texting and I say to you, I felt so disappointed when I didn't hear from you yet, or I felt so sad. You know, or I felt I missed you when I didn't hear from you yesterday. That's naked emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So, so you're saying that um, that we want to get all the way down to how we emotionally feel about things, share our life opinions, share our emotional um, experience in the world prior to ever being physical. Yeah, you want to look. It, it astounds me that people will go to bed with each other and they don't even know each other, that people are lovers before they're friends. And it's very difficult to become friends. After, you know, if, you're, if the goal is to have a friendship, it's much more difficult to establish a friendship once you've already become lovers. It's almost like you're putting the car, you know, you're, you're jumping into the deep end before you even wade in from the shallow end. So you have no, you have no foundation for a relationship except, a se except sexual chemistry. Okay, so since, you know, truth be told, I haven't dated in, you know, 14 years or something. <laughs> um, how long do you think typically it takes for people to really feel, you feel like people have shared enough um, with each other? Like what's a typical time period before people should be physical? Well, I'm going to say this. A lot of people have sex within the first three dates. Three dates. So if you think about this, or, or, or by the fourth date, if they haven't had sex, a lot of people think, like, we got to do it, right? If you've only had three or four dates with somebody, and maybe you've spent four hours on each date, do the math. You've literally spent 12 hours hours getting to know somebody. Mm -hmm. That's not a lot of time. Even if you've been texting back and forth and whatever, no wonder so many people get ghosted or benched or burned because there's no real foundation for a relationship. And so they're jumping into something just based on projection and chemistry. So how long should you wait? I think you should wait two to three months if you can. I do. What's, really, what's really the benefit of, um, of not having, I mean, so let actually first let's differentiate what you talk, what you're talking about, about sharing your bed. Is this like the typical sexual intercourse that we think sex is like penis and vagina kind yes. of, we're talking about a heterosexual situation here, or, you know, do, are, do you think that people could be somewhat physical and mm -hmm. um, find out if there is, you know, that chemistry that people talk about, like when you kiss somebody and you're like, oh, it's not right, you know? So, mm -hmm. um, so first there's that question. And then um, the other one slipped my mind. Answer that one first. <laughs> I absolutely think you should be very intimate and you should enjoy kissing and touching and making out like teenagers. I think that's fabulous and I encourage people to do that, but I don't encourage people to have intercourse and go all the way. There's something about penetration that really is a step above and beyond. And if people don't feel that, then I think they really should step back and reevaluate. You know, Christina, I've had so many clients over the years. I've been doing this for over 15 years. And I've had so many clients who will debate me on the subject of waiting to have sex. I have had client, like I had one client, I will never, ever forget her in the very beginning when I was coaching. And she had lived a very exciting international life. Um, and she was all over the place. She met some exciting men because she did a lot of international travel for work. And she wouldn't wait. And she said, look, it's got to be something other than the sex. 
there's something else going on, but I just don't believe that if I want to sleep with a guy whenever I want to sleep with him, that that's the thing that's sabotaging my relationships. And so she wouldn't wait. And eventually she quit coaching with me. You know, there was nothing really, we had reached a stalemate. Two years later, I got the email from her that I knew I would eventually get that said, you were absolutely right. I met a man and he had just had some prostate trouble and he was on, you know, he couldn't have sex and we had to wait. And she said, we developed the most beautiful, deep, wonderful friendship and connection. And she said, I am in the best relationship I've ever had in my entire life. And she said, the sex was absolutely getting in my way. Mm, how interesting. So, um, you know, beyond being friends, you know, mm -hmm. first, prior, what are really the benefits for the, for the sexual relationship? What are the benefits for the sexual relationship by waiting? Well, again, like when you're, when you're able to communicate and you build this wonderful, emotionally naked connection that seems to be missing for so many people in their relationships, and you make that the priority before jumping into bed, you're able to communicate and talk about what you love, what really turns you on, what you're into. And I've got to tell you there, you know, I also coach a lot of uh, couples. And one of the biggest issues that I, you may see this all the time, Christina, I know I see it myself, is that when I work with my, 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 my singles and my couples, one of the big issues is, is for the men that they lose that emotional connection with the women because they don't, they, the communication is so bad. And so the, the men shut down and turn off sexually. They pull away because one thing, I, I, I mean, I want to hear your thoughts on this too, but I find something that really isn't talked about a lot in our culture because we think men just want sex and you know they're horny and you put a naked woman in front of them and they're going to light up right they're going to get excited or get aroused it's not true when that man is in love with a woman and she's not she's emotionally disconnected from him mm -hmm. well it, it goes back and forth right so mm -hmm. you know men are also given a false prescription of what sexuality is and what masculinity is and they might put up the fa facade in the beginning that it's really just about getting the woman and, you know, mm -hmm. how many women they can be with. But really, truly, on a deep level, the masculine, the, the truly grounded man wants, you know, all of a woman. He doesn't want to just, you know, have sex with her. He wants all of her. So it really is about bringing your full self to the relationship on all levels, you know, on communication, sexually, emotionally, you know, all of those things in order to be satisfied by both, you know, it takes, it takes all of it. Absolutely. So, um, what do you think stops most people from being emotionally naked either on first dates or later in a committed relationship? What really does shut people down? What's stopping? You know, it's really interesting because I just did, I do a, a course, an online, a dating course. Um, and I interviewed my husband. I did like three interviews with my husband. And Benjamin is an incredibly emotionally, um, he's a very securely attached man. And it was really interesting to talk to him because he was telling me in this interview that we did the other day about men and women and sex. And I think I lost the thread of the connection because I know where I was going. Ask the question again, Christina. I'm so sorry. Oh, I was just saying, you know, what do you think um, holds people back from being emotionally naked, either sorry. on a first date or in a committed relationship? So the, the truth is that 
there's so much hype around, you know, this was what Benjamin was saying. And I really, you know, I mean, I know that this is true. There's so much hype around how men love the chase. Like men are what, you know, let a man do the chasing and men want to chase and all of that. And Benjamin was saying that he loves it when a woman comes on to him. He thinks that that is such, such a turn on. He was like, that is absolutely so hot to know that somebody's attracted to you, whether you're a woman or a man. But I think that there's a lot of, you know, Benjamin is a very securely attached male. And so that is coming from a, from a secure man. The men who are the people, men and women alike, who don't, um, you know, who don't want somebody to come on or really, you know, like approach them or come on to them, those are people who are insecurely attached people. And so I think fear of intimacy and closeness is really rampant today. People are so afraid of rejection. They're so afraid of putting themselves out there. And I think that's what prevents us from getting emotionally naked. We have tremendous fear of abandonment and intimacy and especially in the dating world, like people who are coupled up, that's different. But in the dating world, there is a preponderance of insecurely attached people. There are, you know, a tremendous amount of avoidant people in the dating world because those are the people who are not attached. Not, they go from relationship to relationship. Mm, and so what do you do when you, when, when you are, how do you get yourself out of that? Let's say somebody's listening to this and they can say, I could define myself as insecurely attached. I could define myself as avoidant and I want to change that. You know, how, what do you say to that? Well, work with me, <laughs> call me because that's something that I can absolutely help you with. Um, you really have to work with a professional. You've got to have somebody. So, Breaking an avoidant detachment pattern is one of the most, the biggest challenges it, for daters. It really is. I'm not gonna, I, I don't mean to sound fatalistic or negative. The problem for people who, t who are truly avoidant is that they always think it's the other person. They don't think it's them. They don't think that, that, that they are creating those feelings. They think it's because the other person wants too much or wants, is too needy or wants to get too close. And so they push them away. And it's very difficult if you don't identify within yourself that, the, that you're the one who's getting uncomfortable and feeling the pressure. And if you can't learn how to handle that pressure and work inside yourself to start to work through those feelings of that fear of intimacy, it's gonna, it's gonna keep happening. Mm, interesting. So when we're talking about dating and, um, and this fear of intimacy thing, what, you know, what are your ideas for people who have, you know, we talk about deal breakers, you know, what are your deal breakers, but what are your thoughts on people who have, you know, just an extraordinary list of things that they want in a partner and that they're unwilling to, um, to bend on? Do you think that there are, is that a product of, of avoidant? Is that a product of intimacy issues? Or is that just a product of internet dating and like the fact that the world is so vast and we think we can have it all? What do you, what are you, what do you think? So there's so many paradoxes to that list. You know, it's really paradoxical because people think that the more things they put on their list, the more they're going to define exactly what they want. And the truth is, the more things you have on your list, the more exclusionary it becomes. Not inclusionary, but exclusionary. And what you're really doing when you create one of those lists is, you're really looking, whether you know it or not, you're, look, you're, not, you're closing yourself in, you're, you're defining something so precisely that if somebody doesn't fit within those parameters, and those parameters, the more you add into that, it's kind of like, I used to do some work with eHarmony. They, they, for a short time, had an ex, a, a, a concierge um, um, matchmaking service. And what they told me at, 
at uh, eHarmony was every time you added on one criteria, you were lobbing off thousands of potential people to date, thousands. Wow. And they said one thing, one thing, Christina, like um, a non-drinker would literally cut off 75% of your dating pool. If you said on your thing that you uh, would not date anybody that drinks, 75%. 75% of your dating pool would be cut off right there. Now, for somebody who's a non-drinker like me, that's fine because, you know, I mean, first of all, I don't care if somebody drinks. That's the truth. I mean, I don't drink, but it wouldn't matter. But if you have a very strong belief around that and you really don't want that person, you're going to cut off three quarters of your potential partners right there with that one thing. Wow. So those, you know, those lists, uh, when I work with people, I have a very different process. I call it your final five. And we come down, we break it down to five things that you must have in a partner. If those five things aren't there, then you don't date the person. What are the most common um, five things that you see when women or men have whittled down their list? You know, what are truly the most important things to find in a lifelong partner? If you want that long-term committed partnership. You know, this is, that's an interesting question. I can't, the, everybody's final five is different purpose. I mean, based on the process that I use, mm -hmm. every single person's list is completely different. No two people have the same list because your final five is based on all the ways you've compromised in the past. Mm -hmm. So the things that I would have on my final five would not be the same ones you'd have. Like emotionally unavailable wasn't one of my final five. You know, I didn't, I mean, that was never an issue for me. I know it's an issue for thousands, millions of people, but that was never one of my complaints. I mean, did I have emotionally unavailable partners? Probably, but that wasn't like, I would never have defined it that way for me. Mm -hmm. um, so everybody's list is different. I look at where you've settled in the past and why you settled and what you have to have going forward. So I'll give you an example. One of my final five was that I wanted my partner to be my greatest teacher. All my, in every single relationship I'd ever been in prior to my current husband, I set myself up as the authority and the teacher. I thought I was smarter. I mean, this is all bullshit, by the way, but I thought I was smarter and more evolved than my partners. <laughs> and it was a process of me really getting in touch with how egoic that was and how that behavior was limiting me from having what I really wanted. It wasn't that there weren't men who were smarter than me, right? There wasn't that there weren't men out there who were more evolved than me. I was, I was eliminating those men because I thought I was so smart and evolved and that was my comfort zone. I wasn't willing, believe me, to be with Benjamin and have a man who's like, that I look up to that much. You know, I'll never be as smart as he is, but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. I love that. And I can so totally connect to setting myself up as the authority and, and having been in a long-term relationship, you know, it, it's sometimes it's something I definitely like work on actively work on, um, to, you know, honor my partner <laughs> and where he's at because I learned so much from him and I have learned so much from him. And it's almost like, a. um, like a defense mechanism or something, you know, to set yourself up in that position in the relationship as if you know more I, than, than your partner, you know, as mm -hmm. if they have nothing to teach you, you know? And back to the emotional nakedness, this is my emotional nakedness. I come in, you know, I come in authentically and open and real and not being, you know, I mean, I'm, I remember when I met Benjamin and I thought, oh my God, like this man, this is a man. This is a real man. And I knew when I, I, I'm like, he's crazy about me, but I'll never, 
you know, I don't know, I'm not on his level, but I just said to myself, I'm willing to just lay down whatever that old thing was and I'm going to learn. I'll just be a great student, <laughs> you know, and that served me well in this relationship. But I love, you know, I had to be willing to do that. So we, you know, my, the final five is based on the ways that you've compromised in the past and how you need to open up moving forward to make space for the things you really want in a partner. Mm, beautiful. Um, I hope it's not getting too loud in here. It's raining on my skylights. It so. sounds beautiful. <laughs> I love it. Oh, so um, let's see. What is the number one practice or tip you can offer women to allow themselves to be more emotionally naked? Mm, wow. Um, that's a really, really good one. Um, what would be the, well, to, you know, to, to honestly do your final five um, and to really go on your dates with that level of humility and, and, you know, to start taking ownership. I will tell you what I would say, because this is really the crux of what that exercise is about. If there's something, if you want honesty and openness and naked communication, you have to start to bring that. And I find so many women who sit there and wait, they're waiting for the man to do everything. There's something about the way dating is set up today where people are saying the man has to do all the chasing and I want a guy who takes the initiative and I want a guy who does this and I want a guy who does that. Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Get out there, be the change you wish to see in the dating world. If you want those things, bring it. Somebody's got to spark that fire. Somebody's got to get it going. Why not you? The women who get what they want are the, are the initiators. They're the ones who really take the initiative and they put themselves out there. They don't sit back and wait for the guy to do it all. Interesting. So let's say uh, someone is feeling some resistance. They feel fear. They don't feel safe to be emotionally naked. You know, what is a piece of advice that you have for a woman, you know, around taking ownership of, of that and bringing it? How, how can a woman make themselves feel more safe? Well, first of all, um, you know, when I work with people, I give them specific tools to work on their own anxiety and, and emotions around that, because I understand that that is, can be very challenging for people who feel like they've opened up in the past and that they've been taken advantage of. So I understand that. And you do need some very good tools and support. So the first thing I would say is get support. I mean, there are many, many, many amazing coaches and, and therapists and people out there that can help you get over your fear of, you know, of trusting somebody. So that's the first thing. If you have trust issues, you, you're going to have to work through that stuff. Again, that's about taking ownership. If you have trust issues, they're not going to go away just because you like meet the right guy. You're going to meet the right guy because you work through this stuff and you're open and trusting. If you go into relationships and you bring that into the relationship, you're going to create that. You're going to get suspicious of the guy. You're going to get jealous. It's going to infiltrate and destroy your relationship. So you've got to get the support to start to work through this stuff. I know you've been, you know, I know many of you have had your hearts broken. I know many of you have put yourself out there and you've thought that you've given your all and you've gotten your heart broken. Everybody has, but you have to learn how to start to walk through that stuff and take care of your own self while you're out there. So I would you know, suggest getting help if you're afraid to do it. Mm, interesting, and just having this part of the conversation actually ties it back into what you originally talked about was that being emotionally naked is not about airing your dirty laundry. So it's really about doing that personal work so that you don't feel broken or feel like you need all this mending be um, in order to be safely exposed emotionally. Really interesting because when I was, I mean, I was really young when I started dating my partner, I was 24, but I remember 
think, you know, having this night where I don't drink anymore either, but um, having this night where I was drinking and I kind of was like, oh, if you knew all this stuff about me, you wouldn't, you wouldn't feel the same way about me, you know? And um, I think those are the things that we need to deal with privately. And I remember I was in therapy at the time and my therapist said, "Mm -mm, you talk to me about those things, you know, like we work on all that. You do your personal work and then you can bring your full whole self, not like your wounded self, not like it's not okay to be wounded in your partnership. It is okay. You know, but in the beginning, when you're really getting to know each other, you don't want to just be like, oh, I'm broken. Would you still love me? (laughs) Right. (laughs) Totally. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, relationship, too, is a gift when you're doing this. It's really a gift because it does bring up that stuff so you can look at it and heal it. I mean, that's really one of the most beautiful gifts of doing this work and getting into relationship. I had a woman, I'm gonna switch a little bit, but I I was gonna share this. I had a woman that that is in my program and we met yesterday and she was saying that um, she would go on dates and this is a beautiful woman, she's fabulous. And you know, men love her, but she goes on dates and she gets very anxious when somebody starts to like her, when she likes somebody. And she was saying that she would worry about what she wore and, you know, was that stupid? Should I have said that? Shouldn't I have said that? And she jumps into bed with guys. That's another thing. By the fourth date, she was like, oh my God, you know, I was just in. I was the girl that jumped in. And we were talking about this and she said, you know, I'm not doing that. I'm feeling calmer. I'm feeling more grounded, you know, and, 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 and we talked about it and I said, you know what? If you want someone to fall in love with the real, with you, with who you really are at your core, you have got to bring that person on your dates. If you're sending your avatar, somebody's gonna fall in love with your avatar. And it's going to be the wrong guy because he's not even going to be, you know, that's why so many bad relationships are formed. You're not sending your real self out there. And so somebody's falling in love with your avatar and then they find out the real you and it doesn't work. Mm, Or you just feel like you're never seen. Yeah. In the relationship, feeling like you're never seen, never understood. Oh, wow. How interesting. Um, Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that there are dating coaches in the world like you offering (laughs) advice. I wish I had had a dating coach. I was one of the first ones, but I wish I would have given anything to have had a dating coach when I did this. Mm. So Lisa, tell our audience about your amazing gift that you are offering. Oh, wow. Okay. So I have um, a webinar that is talks all about emotionally naked dating and it's fabulous. People seem to really love it. I have some people that, you know, I get letters or, you know, messages all the time where people say, this really changed my perspective on dating. Thank you so much. And if you watch the whole webinar at the end, if you want to jump on a, a free um, discuss, like breakthrough call with me, we can get in and start talking, really dig in. And, you know, I, I can't promise you a full hour, but if there's, you know, I, I set aside an hour for us to talk. And if, you know, if it's really a great conversation, we may be able to spend a full hour on the phone together, really digging into your dating and figuring out what's not working. Oh, awesome. That's a beautiful gift. So if any of you singles are out there looking for your man and trying to figure out how to do it, um, go and click on this gift and and, um, learn from Lisa and all of her many years of experience and then hop on the phone with her. So Lisa, thank you so much for being here and collaborating on this project. I'm so glad that it worked out for us. Oh, I am too. Thank you so much, Christina. It was a pleasure. Oh, thank you. Until we see each other again. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye. Oh, my phone.